Okay, GM, GM. Thank you everyone for coming. We'll give folks just a second to sit down. Uh, my name's Eli. I'm the director of art at Yuga Labs. Is that right? I think, yeah, that's right. Um, so this is our first event as part of the Yuga family. So it's so a very excited. Um, after this portion of the evening, we'll have a bunch of those folks join us as well. So it should be a lot of fun. A uh, couple quick things. One, I uh, want to give a thanks to the proof team. Uh, there's been a lot going on in the last couple of weeks, but being able to pull this together has been pretty amazing. So Maggie, Mao, Becky, Vanessa, Isabel, Amanda, Felix, the whole crew, uh, very appreciative and very grateful to all of you. And then lastly, before we get into it, um, this is really an extraordinary group. So everyone in this room, uh, curators, collectors, artists, builders, uh, my hope is that, yes, the, the focus is on other world for sure, but that there's some interesting collisions and conversations that are of value to all of you in this group, because it really is a special group here. So with that said, I'm going to invite Magnus Resch and, and other world to the stage. Welcome. How's it going? Doing well. This is going to be fun. So Magnus, I have not seen you in person for almost a year. The last time I think was at the Beeple event we did in New York. Is that right? That's right. Yes. That was a fun one. That was, uh, wow. I don't, did anyone go who was at the Beeple? A couple. Yeah, a couple of folks. I mean, that was just impressive. That's when I realized, okay, Proof is not only a great podcast and has a lot of money, but there's actually real content <laughs> and they know how to host great events. From all the events that I attended in the art world, I think that was one that will always stick to me. Yeah, that was a fun one. And Magnus, I'm excited to have you here because you have this interesting purview on everything happening in the contemporary art world, not only on the NFT side, but really more broadly. So, so excited to have you here. And then of course, other world, you know, we're here to celebrate your collection visions. And unlike Magnus, you're probably sick of me at this point because we talk basically every day and have been for almost eight months, uh, but really excited to have you and, and to get to celebrate this collection and dig in together. Uh, it's really going to be interesting, I think. Yeah, I'm uh, really honored to be here. It's an amazing group of people. It's my first solo ex ex exhibition, so it's a very special a special moment for me. And yeah, just uh, love to be here. Yeah, okay, so let's let's dig in, Otherworld. Um, you know, this collection, Visions, there's 12 pieces. Uh, I think most of you in the room got, got a chance to experience it in the other space over there. Uh, but this is what people are seeing now. This is not where it began. Um, you know, many months ago, you and I started talking about the notion of doing something together. It had an entirely different form at that time. Talk about the evolution, where it started, and then ultimately how you got to this place. Yeah, so we first started talking around a physical exhibition was the kind of goal. And then uh, I was working on some texture studies, which were uh, very minimalistic, not much going on, but they had a lot of detail and the deep, like, uh, like, let's say the skin texture, or the texture of cloth, they're very zoomed in and really different from my works. Uh, and I, I drew a few of those and it, they were, were very fun to do, but, uh, you know, the collection was revolving around those and it just didn't feel like project that was strong enough so we went in a different direction i had the piece losing uh, losing my religion that i had worked on uh, alongside those texture studies and while i was working on that i was thinking like oh I, i've drawn these clouds in this certain realistic way but now i want to draw them in a different way or like i want to add some more chaos to the scene so naturally i started making sort of variations that each told a different story and I think once I had two or three of them, I was like, okay, this could be a collection. I was thinking about the overarching goal of it and the story. And uh, yeah, and then created 12 total and here we are. Yeah, so so let's talk about that just a little bit more. This is your first time uh, really creating a collection of this nature. Talk about how you, across 12 pieces, think about narrative and the story. Right, so when i was creating let's say the first six of them or eight of them uh i had a rough idea of uh, 
what the goal of the project was. Um, I knew it, it was about the tragic side of the side of the uh, uh, human condition. So with that in mind, I was creating specific stories uh, around that, th things that many human beings will experience or have, um, hopefully not too many times. But um, so it was, it's, it's, you know, revolves around the dark side of the human condition. And the first piece is, you know, aesthetically similar to my previous works. And it's kind of a familiar welcome to the project. And everything in between is a uh, sort of experiment that is uh, more chaotic, uses more abstract elements. And then the ending is uh, also pretty familiar. So uh, that's how I approached it. Yeah. And, and I think if uh, I'm not mistaken, in the naming of each piece, uh, that's where it came last. Is that right? For most of them, yes. Even the first piece that I losing my religion it was called a coin for a dream because there's in the center of it someone putting a coin into a goblet and that would that would, that was like fine but there was just something about it when i was working with the rest of them it wasn't I, w I didn't feel too confident about that it really wasn't the the right title and then i picked losing my religion which was perfect with me and then actually the collector who collected it is that was one of the main reasons he collected uh, it was because of the title and then he, looking at the piece he loved the message yeah so. and, and you touched on this a little bit other world you know the themes in this collection tragedy relatively dark themes violence i know in the creation of this collection the 12 pieces you had this internal dialogue where you wanted to challenge yourself to say you know why do i always gravitate towards those themes what does it look like to sort of challenge myself and, and look to the other side? Talk about that process and then maybe how piece number 12 represents that. Yeah, I was, I mean, I've always drawn violence even as a kid. I've never really been a violent person, uh, but maybe sometimes I would get into fights at school, but nothing crazy. Um, but yeah, I think when I did 11 of them, I was like, I kind of want this to end on a high note, relatively speaking. So I wanted to create something positive, but nothing was really coming to me um, until it just did. And and that's the, the last piece is uh, Believe Again. So, yeah, I still don't know the answer to why I'm drawn to these things. Um, but, yeah, that's that's how it went. Yeah. And, and then, Magnus, maybe over to you. You know, in our space, and when I say our space, I mean sort of the NFT digital art space, the collection as a container is common on the the generative art side for sure, but less so uh, on the one of one side where, where other worlds has been releasing most of his work. Of course, you know, the solo exhibition, the collection, that container, very common in the traditional art world, the so-called traditional art world. Talk about what you're seeing and sort of why there's value in contextualizing a body of work in that way. So how the traditional art world works is they're intermediaries, galleries. And they have, on average, eight shows per year. So artists, and shows are assigned usually a year or two years in advance. So the gallerist goes to the artist and says, all right, this is your slot. And then the artist really focuses on this slot and produces works exactly for that uh, exhibition that lasts six to eight weeks. So their mindset is really driven by that idea, okay, this is my slot, I have to create something for that particular show. So they go there, they look at the rooms, and then they build something exactly for the um, for those exact rooms. Um, for the gallery, it also helps because it is easier to frame it from a marketing perspective. This is the series, this is the show, this is the end date. While in the digital space, it's way easier since the intermediaries are all working, apart from proof, uh, are all working um, online. I just release my uh, my works and I don't need to think in terms of the way that uh, traditional artists have to do it in that space. That doesn't mean that the one-on-ones that are released uh, are of less value or um, the amount of work that went into it is is less than, than artists and traditional work. Yeah, that makes sense. And other world for you, um, you know, this collection is digital, absolutely, but also as everyone saw, you know, there's really a physical instantiation of each piece. For me, just, just quickly, um, you know, I think the physical uh, manifestation of these works and of work generally that's wholly digital otherwise is an interesting half step 
for traditional collectors, physical art collectors to engage with, for example, your work for the first time. For you, though, Otherworld, why was that important? Yeah, I think um, it, it has. it's sort of a different experience to look at a physical work. Um, for most people, I think still uh, having art, looking at art on a screen, uh, it might kind of uh, click in their mind that I'm looking at a screen and they might think about that instead of thinking about the art. And maybe they'll get over it and then look at the art, for example. But just the physical aspect, for example, a print or an oil painting, we've all grown up with that. We're all familiar. It's been around for hundreds of years. Uh, and it's just a more, more familiar uh, method of taking in art. Um, so I think it's very powerful to use that and still be in the crypto art scene, but to use that to reach uh, an audience that is more familiar to that. Mm -hmm. and, and Magnus, you know, one of the big challenges with wholly digital work, and some work should be viewed uh, in a digital form factor, definitely, uh, and maybe only, um, particularly animated works, for example. Uh, but you know, the, the, the big challenge for work that can be viewed as a physical is that if it's digital only, it's really hard to live with, right? As a collector, you can get these different screens, but most are suboptimal. How do you think about that from the collector perspective? I, I thought the same, but then I visited Pablo Rodriguez Frail uh, yeah. last week in his house in Miami. And he is, Pablo is a very active collector of digital art and seeing how it was presented, the frames, he, so the frames really matter. Just having them on the TV screen, I think is not enough. So having them in a really nice frame presents just, I mean, it's, it's the same with traditional art, right? The frame matters. When you look at an Andreas Gorski, the photographer work, Without the frame, it just doesn't look as good as with the frame. So in the digital art space, it's similar. And how Pablo has it in his house um, is um, traditional pieces, physical pieces next to digital ones in a nice frame. And that's when I realized, wow, I mean, we are just at the beginning. Mm, yeah. I think he has some people sculptures too, which is this whole other way of experiencing digital art as well. Yeah. And not yet other world, but this uh, hopefully will change. <laughs> yeah, very soon. Uh, other world, Paul, the printer, is not here at the moment. He's joining us later. It's his birthday, which which is wonderful, yeah, yeah. and we'll celebrate that later. Um, talk about the process of working with Paul and, and working on the physicals. Paul is, you know, he's been in the business, uh, printing business, for like, I think, 40 years. He's a very funny character, super, um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. You, you guys will meet him today. Um, and... Uh, yeah, it's just a lot. I, I mean, I was fortunate enough to live like 10 minutes or 15 minutes to the print shop. So I was going multiple times a week to uh, see multiple kind of uh, updates to each piece. So I would go see the first print, didn't look good. I went back, changed some aspects of it just for the physical so it could kind of match the digital. One of the main things was like the darks were too dark. So I worked on that, um, but got the hang of it. And I think uh, they came out well. Yeah, they look amazing. Um, okay, shifting gears a little bit, Magnus, uh, I, I want to go over to you. Uh, we've been doing something with this collection, um, which is counter to some of the Web3 ethos uh, in, in some ways that should be open and decentralized and permissionless, which is we're, we're doing private sales. I saw it, inquire for price. It feels like <laughs> yeah. it feels like my world. Well, yeah. So, and, and you know, the impetus for doing that, and we've done it with Summer Wagner's collection as well, and Summer's in the audience, um, is to really curate the collectors of these pieces and find real stewards uh, of these pieces. Uh, but as I said, it does run counter to some of the core ethos of this space or for some people. Talk about sort of curating collectors how this is done in the traditional art world very often. I mean, this is one element. The other element, and I want to talk about this first, is um, what Proof is actually doing here. Mm. So before the, the whole premises of Web3 was artist to collector, and intermediary is just the platform, OpenSea or whatever, right, taking 2%. Um, in the traditional art world, intermediaries are the gallerists taking 50%. And now here comes proof working with a digital artist and saying, okay, so we act, we have an existing collector base, but instead of putting up on our platform and taking a few percentage, we will actually promote the artist and organize a show and do all this. So you're taking on the role of an intermediary, but 
a um, very helpful for the artist, nurturing the artist and promoting the artist, what galleries um, have traditionally been doing. But you're doing it in a uh, more flexible way. So he is not stuck with you. He can partner, he can do his own stuff and so on. So I think this is- I told is, you, he's sick of me. <laughs> maybe that's why, right? Um, so I believe this is the model of the future. Also, also something that will happen in the traditional art world where gallerists will become more agents of artists rather than having this very fixed, um, almost contract-like relationship with um, artists. Magnus, do you think that's ultimately healthy? Because of course, uh, if Otherworld and I, for example, have a, a contractual long-term obligation to each other, we have this vested interest over the long-term in a very durable way. Is that flexibility ultimately a healthy thing? I think so too, because when you, when you look at an, an, a gallery has on average 20 artists that they represent, but on average, a gallery only has one employee and that's the, um, the founder. So how can you manage the career of 20 artists? It just doesn't work. Think about how much work you put into organizing this event and promoting other world and so on. It's a lot of work. So it just doesn't make sense to uh, work with that many artists. And on the other hand, what you're doing is you give, you leave artists the flexibility to also do um, other things um, and not be um, not be stuck with you. So that's why I I think it's um, uh, it's important and it's it will be the future. Another thing, what you do and you asked that about curating the collectors, mm. yes. That's something, placing artworks is something that we all know from the traditional artwork. I want my works of the artists that I work with to go um, with top collectors. Why? Because provenance, as we call it, so the history, who owned that work, has a huge impact on the price point. For example, if uh, Leo DiCaprio owned the work, the prices are higher, and you saw it right now with... Um, um, what's his name? The, the um, British singer. Anyway, he had his... Who's that guy with the funny glasses? Elton John collection, oh. thank you. The rocket man. <laughs> and uh, his works that he sold from his collection usually sell higher than, um, than uh, if it hadn't been with him. Yeah. So placing them really makes sense. Yeah. And, and another world for you. Um, I mean, this has been somewhat challenging, right? Because it requires being a bit more patient. Um, I'm curious for your thoughts on sort of curating collectors. Yeah, you know, collectors play a very big role in an artist's success. And I think there is, you know, a set amount of collectors that they just like to collect work and they'll show it, but then there's another set of collectors that maybe take it a step further and they exhibit the works. Uh, for example, uh, Kazomo from the Medici Group, um, whenever he collected one of my pieces in uh, 2021, he never, it was never talked about, but basically, a year later, he exhibited it along with his collection in like London, for example. Um, he also exhibited his collection in uh, New York Town Square, but my, mine couldn't be up because it was violent. But anyway, that's <laughs> another story. Um, but yeah, so I think the right collectors, the ones who really connect with the work, um, uh, they matter. And it doesn't, you know, a collector doesn't need to go over, you know, overachieve with, with the piece. Like, I'll be happy to give it to a collector who, you know, there's a significant meaning for him. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a healthy balance to have uh, both types of collectors. Yeah. So Magnus, maybe I'll go back to you again. As you look ahead now um, for the, the future of NFTs, let's start there. Um, what do you see? And let's, let, let me caveat uh, a little bit further with art NFTs. Yeah, with this audience, I probably get slaughtered if I say any. <laughs> no, I I believe um, so. Digital art, when we look at this, is has a very small percentage um, compared to in terms of transaction uh, value compared to um, traditional paintings. So paintings is by far the number one medium, followed by uh, photographs, and then followed by uh, sculpture, and then digital art, performance art. So we talk about ninety two percent is paintings. Um, photography is 6%. And think about this, photography has been around for 50 years, right? So it's really totally accepted. Um, I believe digital art, uh, seeing, seeing what we saw over there, mm. making that bridge, what you're doing, bringing in existing collectors and establishing it amongst existing uh, traditional institutions will be the way forward. The piece, a refix piece at the MoMA had the highest visibility yeah. in the history of the MoMA. No other piece was seen more than, than that piece. So 
there we go. I believe this is the way forward. And there's another element to it. Um, and that's why I really like what you're doing, Other World, combining physical pieces with digital pieces. I believe in the future, every painting that leaves the studio will be registered on the blockchain. Yeah. So whenever it's traded, the artists get royalties and it also cuts out the intermediaries because I don't need to pay 20% to Sotheby's on the buying and on the selling side, 40%, think about this, just for them to do the provenance research, which is super important and they have to do it right now, but their job will also be much easier once the work is registered on the blockchain because then I can sell it directly to a collector and don't require the intermediary anymore. Yeah, and, and other world for yourself, how do you think about sort of the future of your own practice, whether that's physical or digital? Yeah, I don't ever see myself, you know, leaving the crypto art scene, but <clears throat> I do want to experiment in new mediums uh, and you know, bigger projects that uh, kind of go that are maybe digital and or may not be digital. They may be even fully physical. So that's that's where I'm, I'm yeah. trying to go. Yeah. <laughs> but but what would be what's your goal? Like a long term goal? Do you want to be in the MoMA or do you want to have your own museum? That would be uh, good to be in the MoMA for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I've I've thought about opening my own sort of gallery at one point. Maybe that's not like the goal of, of myself. Like I want my art and that's a separate thing. Um, but for my art, uh, I just want to reach as many people as I can and tell the stories that I want to tell um, and create just bigger and higher quality projects that reach new audiences each time. For example, uh, a custom Porsche in my you know style that, that reaches, you know, uh, car collector market or something like that. Um, uh, and then working on physical works, uh, I have The Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch, which is my favorite painting, having a project that's based on that, sort of recreating that. Um, and then there's gonna be a physical aspect to it. So just bigger projects, trying to create the most uh, high quality works that I can in the finite time that I have. Because there's like an infinite amount you could progress as an artist, but you don't have an infinite amount of time. Yeah. You're also doing your PhD, yeah. <laughs> so you have even less time. Even less time right now. Yeah, I'll graduate in May, so I'll, I'll do I have more time for art. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I mean, but Eli, it's one of these stories, right? Unbelievable. Mm. That's why I'm such a big fan of yeah. this whole space because we, during COVID, right, you just started doing this thing, and now you are a serious artist who can actually afford a living from the practice. Think about this: average annual income of an artist in the U.S. is around twenty-five thousand dollars. Right. So that's why it's so hard to be an artist and making it to this level that you are at is unbelievable. It's exceptional. Less than 1% of artists, practicing artists ever get shown in, in a gallery setting and, um, and scoring those prices that you have on top of having the opportunity to show it to a large audience is just um, a, a great achievement so far. And nobody will ever take this away from you. Yeah, thank you. It's a, truly a blessing and I do not take it for granted. I love that. That's a great place, I think, to, to open it up for questions. Um, I think Maurizio maybe has a, a microphone somewhere. I, do, right I would love to take any questions. Lynette? So you mentioned when you were doing the physical printing process that you were like, hey, some of these blacks are too dark, things like that. Um, when you went through that process and you kind of said, okay, this is the artist proof that I want, what was the one piece out there where you just it clicked for you and you knew that you had everything kind of where you wanted it balance wise and then just i guess more about that phys, you know that digital to physical experience yeah. kind of seeing it in the space like if you could tell a little bit more about that because i just found it really interesting where you're like the darks were too dark and i just really want to kind of get in your brain yeah i mean for most pieces i think i did multiple updates to them Except for, I believe, Tides of War, that one came out like perfect that I, I, you know, the first try, because there wasn't too much darks. <laughs> but um, I, I really liked the last piece, uh, Believe Again. That's why we printed it at a larger scale. Um, it ends on that note. It's the only piece that does not have any violence in it. Um, so I would say seeing that piece uh, physically printed was a, a very profound experience. Yeah, Amanda. Hi, Otherworld. Um, just absolutely, absolutely loved uh, this entire series. You know, Tides of War, you just mentioned that, <clears throat> is 
the one piece that really, really stands out. I love that it is uh, the one that is, you know, on this cream background. It just feels so strong to me. Um, I was looking at it actually with Maggie and she told me to look a little closer. There was like a little circle in the corner with the little characters. Um, and then I started looking around and I was like, there are so many of these characters um, in these, in each one of these pieces. So can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, some of the characters that are in, in the series? Yeah, so you have, I mean, it's based off of the fiends, which are the hooded characters. They sort of resemble the dark side of humans. It's, a, it's also a natural side, uh, the way I look at it. Um, but yeah, I like works that have a lot of detail and that you could appreciate it from, you know, from different uh, uh, levels. So you could look at it uh, from across the room and you could catch your eye, just the colors and the overall structure of it. Then you get closer to it, you see some of the details. And then some of the very fine details, you have to get really close, like the little red devils or white devils. Or um, I liked that, you know, pieces to have that kind of, you know, different dimensions to them. Any other questions? Let's see. Yeah. Thanks for the uh, for the exhibition. It's really incredible. And Magnus, just a quick question, just from the collector's standpoint. Um, coming from the traditional world, what are you starting to see uh, among your, you know, kind of friends and peers, whether they're gallerists or or other collectors from the traditional side, in terms of their interest, appetite, education in the kind of digital space, very little. So when you look at Art Basel Miami during the hype years 2021, um, I think I saw maybe 15 digital artworks amongst 5,000 works that were exhibited. Um, why is that? Because the existing artwork collectors are um, 65 on average. So that's not the typical group who's buying digital art. Um, that's why the, the supply side, so galleries, um, are just not so actively uh, reaching out to digital artists and giving them the opportunity show simply because the demand is not interested in it yet. I believe the art market has a huge opportunity increasing its size by bringing in exactly those people. What we saw during the hype of the NFT season, um, and I really call it the first season because there will be a lot more, um, what we saw is that people who have never collected art before suddenly started being interested in art. Maybe, yes, they were interested in investing in it. Average holding period of an NFT was 30 days. Average holding period for an to artwork, physical artwork is 30 years, okay? So they were there to, to make some money, but they were some of them were actually interested in the, in the art itself. So what we learned there is that there's a whole new group of people who are interested in buying art, and the traditional art market should be very open to um, convert these people because they need them. Yeah, Magnus, for me, I think when you describe that, that age demographic, um, I mean, it's such a, a huge opportunity, really, to speak to that that audience more effectively. Okay, I think on that we will wrap up. Thank you everyone so much for coming. Uh, really an honor to have this group here. Thank you Otherworld, thank you Magnus so much. Thank you everyone, thank you for coming.